Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In this video, I'm continuing on my um, coverage of the report called Global Tipping Points. Um, and this uh, report talks about positive tipping points and negative tipping points. Most of the negative tipping points are Earth system tipping points. So in this particular video, um, I'm going to talk about the part of the report that focuses on some of the negative Earth system tipping points, specifically uh, in biodiversity. Okay, so it's a very important um, topic. You know, obviously we're getting massive changes to Earth systems, uh, none so greater than in the biosphere. So this map covers some of the different regions, the different biomes of the Earth, and some of the different tipping points that are occurring there. So I'll talk about this in detail. Basically, um, we're starting here on page 78 of the report. And uh, so, so tipping points in the biosphere is, is the uh, today's today's topic. Uh, just hit my camera here. Make sure I'm stabilized and I've got my coffee. My throat gets dry. I've been eating lots of honey roasted peanuts. Uh, I got a gift of um, eight pounds of peanuts. So I started in on the honey roasted was my top choice. So yeah, my, it's dried out my throat. Okay, so tipping points in the biosphere. So I'll talk about the summary first. So there's lots of scientific evidence for tipping points across the biosphere, right? The biosphere is basically the summation of all of Earth's ecosystems. So we're getting human driven or anthropogenic changes in the biosphere in terms of habitat loss, pollution, exploitation, and increasingly climate change. All these things are degrading ecosystems across the planet. Some of these ecosystems uh, will pass and are passing so-called tipping points beyond which there's a regime shift to an alternative um, and often less diverse or beneficial ecosystem state. Okay, so we get a tipping from one state to another state or a regime shift uh, in the case of the biosphere. So there's evidence for tipping points emerging across many particular biomes. So in forests, for example, large parts of the Amazon rainforest could tip to degraded forest or impoverished savanna. There's threats to tipping in boreal forests. They're possible, but more uncertain. And there's also uh, in the temperate forests, the current temperate forest disturbances could lead to tipping. But again, it's a bit unclear. We know more with the Amazon rainforest, the tropical forests, as opposed to the boreal forests or the temperate ones in between the, the, the previous two. In the open savannas, savannas are mostly grasslands with the odd tree, but no closed canopy. And also in dry lands, drying could lead to desertification in some areas, while in others, encroachment by trees and shrubs could see these biodiverse ecosystems shift to a forested state or a degraded state. There's nutrient pollution and warming can trigger lakes to switch to an algae dominated low oxygen state in a process called eutrophication, or, you know, this can happen when the dissolved organic content gets too high, the runoff, etc. We're seeing coral reefs around the world experiencing tipping points as there's more frequent warming driven bleaching events of the coral. Also, they're stressed by pollution, extreme weather events and diseases. So, so these coral reefs then tip to a degraded algae dominated state. So the reefs actually die in their present form, algae takes over and the biodiversity is much lower. We're losing the mangroves and the sea grasses and the kelp around the world's oceans. They're all at risk of regional tipping. 
Um, the kelp forests are important for marine food webs and some fisheries are also known to be able to collapse. You know, fisheries in the past have collapsed from over exploitation, over fishing, but now there, all these other stressors are starting to impact them as well. So these tipping points of the biosphere, they threaten the livelihoods of millions of people. Some thresholds are likely imminent. Stabilizing the climate is critical to reducing the likelihood of widespread ecosystem tipping points. But tackling other pressures can also help increase ecological resilience to push back the tipping and to support human well-being. Okay, so the key messages um, about tipping points in the biosphere are there's evidence that exists for tipping points in a variety of ecosystems, including forest dieback, tree and bush encroachment in savanna and grasslands, dryland desertification, lake eutrophication, coral reef die-off, and fishery collapse. There are several biomes like mangroves in the Amazon rainforest. They're losing resilience rapidly. They're approaching key tipping thresholds with current warming levels already triggering coral reef die-off, tipping points in multiple regions. We're gonna be living in a world very soon with no coral reefs. Ecosystem tipping points can be driven by many different drivers that are included but not limited to climate change that interact in complex ways across many species and feedbacks. Okay, so everything is urgent. I don't need to go into the recommendations. It'll sound like a broken record, um, but there are things that we can do to try to delay the onset of the loss of the biosphere. Okay, so I'll just talk a little bit about the intro and then we'll get into the specific biome. So basically the Earth's biosphere, it's the sum of all global ecosystems. So it's a key part of the Earth climate system or the Earth overall Earth system. It drives many biogeochemical cycles that maintain the climate system and keep Earth habitable. Ecosystems are the complex systems composed of assemblages of living organisms and their physical environment at the local scale. So you might think of an area of rainforest in the Brazilian state of Amazonas, for example. Okay, at a larger scale, these, um, these ecosystems, the biosphere, it forms regional groupings like, you know, the Madeira Tapajos moist forest ecoregions, for example. It forms different ecosystem functional groups like tropical, subtropical, lowland rainforests, different biomes, tropical, subtropical forests as we go to larger scales. Ultimately, the whole biosphere is connected. Humans are also an, an integral part of the biosphere where social systems are closely intertwined with ecosystems so that they can be seen as joint social ecological systems which is the dynamics of both interact as a sim, sim, single complex adaptive system. Now these ecosystems around the world are being globally degraded by multiple human driven pressures. At the species level, 1 million animals and plants face extinction. Extinctions are happening up at up to 100 times the natural background rates averaged over the last 100 years leading some to assess that the Earth has now entered the sixth mass extinction in the nearly four billion years of life's history on the Earth. The Living Planet Index indicates that populations are declining in around half of vertebrate species. There's an average decline across all species of 69% since 1970. You know, that's two thirds. We've lost two thirds of the species since 1970 on average across all species. The key drivers of the biodiversity loss in order of importance are land and sea use change, that's destroying habitat, direct exploitation like overfishing, climate change, pollution and invasive alien species. Notice climate change is not currently the leading factor, but it's becoming a leading factor with further warming. 
In fact, global warming moving from 1.5 to 2 Celsius increases the number of species facing the loss of most of their ranges from 4 to 8% for vertebrates, loss of 4 to 8% for vertebrates like mammals, 8 to 16% for plants, and 6 to 18% loss for insects. Okay, 3.2 Celsius of warming would increase these. We'd have 26% loss in vertebrates or mammals, 44% loss in plants, and 49% in insects. So we're talking about huge percentages of populations being decimated. Together, these losses are harming many ecosystems' ability to function, so they're threatening the critical ecosystem services that humanity relies on, like getting food, clean water, and removing about a third, 31% of human-emitted CO2. As with many other complex systems, ecosystems have been proposed to feature these nonlinear changes like tipping points, beyond which dramatic shifts to a different ecological state are expected, further threatening biodiversity and bioabundance. So the ecosystems are also subject to many co-stressors with complex interactions, with changing disturbance regimes, eroding resilience. So as, as the ecosystems get weaker and weaker, they're less resilient, they're less able to adapt, they're less able to handle the stresses from all of the other things, including climate change. Complex ecological and social ecological dynamics crossing multiple scales can make it hard to discern the tipping thresholds in observation. So it's hard to figure them out in, in advance. And uh, the ecosystem functions or composition can have threshold responses. In many cases, um, you know, with small, small changes, it's a linear change and then suddenly they can tip over. So tipping at the global biosphere scale has been discussed, but deemed unlikely. So it's more of local ecosystem shifting globally aggravating to, to relatively linear changes in response to human-driven press, pressures. Empirical evidence for tipping has, though, been found in multiple ecosystems from the local to regional scale, like in lakes, coastal zones, marine food webs, rangelands, and forests. Okay, so there's a lot, you know, we're, we're playing with fire here. You know, in ecology, the terms regime shift and critical transition have been used interchangeably with tipping points, despite differences in meaning, right? A regime shift refers to a shift in the current state of an ecological or social ecological system from one partially stable state to another that's often large, relatively sudden, depending on system size and feedback time scales and long lasting it entails a reorganization in the structure and functioning of the system. A critical transition refers to an abrupt shift in a system that occurs at a specific critical threshold in external conditions. So tipping point basically covers them all. We know these systems are getting less resilient, i.e. they're losing the ability to maintain functioning in response to change and regenerate in the face of shocks, sometimes adap adapting and transforming in the process. Okay, so they're all losing resilience. So let's look at the map, which I showed you at the very beginning, again. And this shows you a map of the Earth, and you can see the different regions. Um, you've got the tropical dry forests in the brown. You've got tropical rainforests, um, you know, these, these regions here. You've got the temperate forests in the middle. You've got the boreal forests in the north and the tundra, there's savannas and grasslands. The dry lands, the color code's wrong. This should be the, the, the brownish color. These are the dry lands. Uh, I mentioned the tundra, the, the lakes are in blue. We've got mangroves along the coast. You can't see them well on this map. Fisheries, you know, of course they're throughout the oceans, but just the coastal ones are shown. Seagrass meadows and kelp forests are very important. You've got the coral reefs. Here. Now, these are the tipping system confidence that these systems actually tip um, is on this. So, yes, they're going to tip in red with very high confidence. You can see that the coral reefs are there, the kelp forests, some of the lakes, the Amazon rainforests, all these things are high in the biosphere on the tipping scale. 
there's some that are unclear, like the biological pump, for example. Um, and there's some where we don't think, uh, we, we don't think they're probably going to tip. Okay, so Southeast Asian tropical forest, right? There's lots of moisture, lots of rain, because it's right on the coastlines, whereas it's not going to tip like the Amazon rainforest, for example. Okay, <clears throat> so a lot of different uh, regions are covered, and we're going to look at them in more detail. Um, they're, in fact, they're in a lot of detail in this, um, in this um, chart. So if you just look at a couple things on this section, look at this map here, and look at the chart. Okay, so it covers the, so here's the forest. We've got the Amazon rainforest, dieback of the Amazon rainforest. We've got the Congo rainforest and the Southeast Asian rainforest diebacks. And the key drivers, direct climate cause, atmospheric warming, of course, increasing in the rainforest. Uh, Non-climate cause, deforestation and degradation of the rainforest is occurring. That's by humans. That's not from climate change. Uh, another climate of impact is drying, and there's climate-related effects. Uh, fire frequency and intensity is increasing in the Amazon rainforest. Um, and uh, there's also, of course, heat waves occurring. There's ENSO intensification in the Amazon occurring, and there's an AMOC and, and uh, the, the, the um, polar gyre, south polar the gyre, that's the upper branch of the AMOC, weakening, could collapse, that will affect the Amazon greatly. Okay, so those are the key drivers. And then there's the, the key impacts are loss of biodiversity, regional rainfall reduction, for example, from Amazon dieback across the Amazon basin and Southern American cone. You get carbon emissions uh, increasing because the rainforest isn't a carbon sink anymore. And there's remote impacts on rainfall patterns over all, all of the planet from, you know, that would be an impact from a collapsing Amazon rainforest. The key feedbacks are moisture recycling, fire and albedo changes. And there's thresholds, 1000 to 1250 millimeters of annual rainfall is considered a threshold. Um, 400, you know, a deficit of 400 to 450 millimeters accumulated water deficit, another possible tipping point. Uh, seven to eight month dry season length, another tipping point. 20 to 40 percent deforestation, it could tip. And uh, three and a half degrees, it says, um, as their, their estimate, okay? And then there's also things for the Congo rainforest and um, the Southeast Asian rainforest tipping with different amounts of rainfall could occur. Okay, this is this incorporates the best science that we know. Um, of course, the boreal forests, um, which I showed where, you know, in the northern um, hemisphere, far north, uh, there's two uh, potential tipping points. One is a southern dieback, so the dieback of the boreal forest on the southern extent. Another one is the boreal forest northern expansion as you get warming. Okay, so the dryback, southern dryback is drying is increasing. There's more fire frequency and intensity and there's atmospheric warming occurring. Those are the key drivers and that leads to bio, biodiversity loss, carbon emission from dieback, carbon drawdown from expansion. Um, the key feedbacks are fire, albedo changing and moisture recycling changes. And, uh, you know, the, the, then there's the, the, um, the boreal forest, the northern expansion. We're getting permafrost thaw, so you get shrubification. We're getting insect outbreaks is another key one. There's uh, non-climate related deforestation and degradation. You know, climate is heat waves. Uh, and then the climate effects, uh, terrestrial greening, um, uh, as as you go, as the shrubs grow further and further north, and then small trees and larger trees, the vegetation albedo is ch changes. Uh, you get sea ice albedo decline affecting this region and precipitation changes. Okay, so there's complex interactions. So as you get warming, you get dieback of the northern boreal forest. 
you get higher albedo, um, okay, as, as the green forests are replaced by dead wood and grass. So that would cause a cooling, but you get less evaporative cooling. You guess the, the evaporative cooling is the moisture that comes out of the leaves of the trees. And uh, with less evaporative cooling, the whole region warms, etc. Okay, so there's all of those things going on. Uh, there's also temperate forest dieback. You know, it's getting warmer there. There's more droughts and heat waves. We're getting insect outbreaks, which weaken the resilience of the trees. Uh, we're getting higher winds, causing damages, derechos, etc. Um, humans are deforesting and fragmenting the forest. So the, and the fire frequency is increasing. So all of these things are leading to biodiversity loss, carbon emissions up, regional warming in summer due to less evaporative cooling, less cloud cover, less atmospheric uh, water supply, less groundwater recharge. Okay, so you can reach these tipping points. There's widespread thresholds uncertain. As we go to, uh, people don't often think of the savanna and grasslands degradation, but it can occur. Um, the uh, non-climate effects are we suppress fires and we can get more trees growing and the trees can encroach on the savanna because you don't get the shading, you don't get the grass growing. Overgrazing is another non-climate effect. Um, the direct climate effects are increased precipitation intensity. When it rains, it rains really hard and the water can run off quickly. Terrestrial greening, uh, afforestation is adding forests, ocean circulation shifts can affect the, the currents and the, the temperatures. And that happened years ago with the Sahel shift. So we're getting biodiversity loss, groundwater depletion, nutrient cycles disrupting and reduced fires um, in these uh, savanna and grasslands, okay, so we can get these critical thresholds where, you know, there's something called a fire percolation threshold, 60% flammable cover. You know, if, the, if there's less flammable cover than that, then the fires that occur won't, um, won't spread. And uh, then you can get more tree growth, and this, is, this means that the savanna can tip into a forest-type region. So, so that's an impact. Um, dry lands uh, is, is another biome where we're get, they're getting even drier, the atmosphere is warming even more. There's land use intensification, like for livestock grazing, agriculture, urbanization. More heat waves, more rainfall variability, we're getting terrestrial greening, some of these dry lands. Um, so we lose dry lands, insect outbreaks, invasive species. You know, we can change, the, we get huge biodiversity loss, aridification or desertification, groundwater depletion, regional rainfall changes, shifts in species composition, like shrubs encroaching on the dry lands, and uh, vegetation uh, starting to grow there that wasn't there before. So there's, there's this thing called the aridity index, and there can be tipping when it's 0 0.54, 0 0.7, and 0.8. Um, I can talk more, I'll talk more about that when I get to that section. Tipping in the freshwater lakes. Um, freshwater lakes, you, we, the eutrophication driven anoxia, anoxia lack of oxygen. So you get um, nutrient pollution, which is not a climate related thing. Then you, you also get atmospheric warming and stratification of the lake, precipitation changes. So you get a biodiversity loss, water quality declines, um, and you get uh, phytoplankton blooms because of all the nutrients, and then the phytoplankton dies, it's decomposed um, and uses up all the oxygen, so we can create oxygen dead lakes at the bottom. Um, if there's 20 to 30 milligrams of phosphorus per liter, uh, no clear warning can occur, you can get rain fall thresholds on the on the eutrophication process. You also get dissolved organic matter loading causing browning of the lakes, um, then terrestrial grazing uh, is if there's more terrestrial terrestrial greening rather means there could be more dissolved organic matter in the water running into the lakes 
Afforestation is a non-climate human thing. If we afforest around the lake, we can cause more DOM loading of lakes. Anyway, we get again by biodiversity loss, more greenhouse gas emissions, anoxia-driven phosphorus released from the sediment. If there's greater than 10 milligram dissolved organic content per liter, you know, you get these browning of these lakes, which has all these negative effects to the life in the lakes. You know, lakes can appear and they can also disappear. So in permafrost regions, thaw-related thermokarst uh, slumps, permafrost slumps, you can get lake forming and then that lake can drain. Um, you also get glacier lake formation and they can drain very quickly. Um, so these are very uh, abrupt events. Uh, you can have lakes uh, where you go from a nitrogen to phosphorus limiting switch. So you get nutrient pollution, atmospheric de deposition in the lakes, and the, the ratio of nitrogen to phosphor can, can completely change the lake uh, biome. Also, you can get salinification. Sal sal salinization of the lake okay so with more warming more drought water use intensification increases so you can get salt released from the sediment and uh, the lakes can can basically turn uh, brackish cut you know um, being devastating to the uh, to the biosphere in the lake also on coastal lakes as sea level rises you can get salt water intrusion uh, invasive species are always an issue. Um, with warming, you get a warming driven range expansion. Um, and uh, there's human mediated introduction of invasive species, it, it leads to biodiversity loss, they can take over. You know, on coast, we have warm water, coral reef die off, of course, the oceans warming, get marine heat waves, get spreading diseases, ocean acidification, pollution, nutrients and sediment, um, disruption, ships and over harvesting of fish in the regions, invasive species, higher storm intensities, higher sea levels, all these things can be devastating for coastal reefs. Now it's important to note 25% of marine species have life stages dependent on coral reefs. Losing coral reefs takes a huge hit on the entire marine food chain going to talk about the loss of commercial and artisanal fisheries, coastal protection loss as we lose reefs. And we're talking about, you know, it says 1.2 Celsius global warming, temporarily variable heat stress and degree heat weeks degree. We can measure that 8 to 12 degree uh, heating weeks. Long-term consequences of greater than 350 ppm of atmospheric CO2, acidification, threat, you know, all these things stress the, the reefs. Okay, so those are the key things. Um, and of course, the, there's the mangroves and the kelp um, as well, and the seagrasses that aren't actually on this chart. Okay, but here we get back. And then basically, um, there's more and more details on the specific Thing. So I'm just going to talk about the different highlights of these biomes. So here's where the tropical forests are. So these all go back to the first map I showed you. This picks out the tropical forest, the wet ones, and there's a couple of dry ones. They cover one, almost 2 billion hectares. Um, they're home to a disproportionate amount of the Earth's species and biodiversity, and they store huge amounts of carbon. So it's about 471 gigatons of carbon in the soils and biomass through the evapotranspiration. So it rains here. Uh, then there, a lot of the moisture comes back out of the leaves and goes into the air and rains in this region and rains in this region. So water molecule falling here can fall and fall and fall, you know, seven or eight different places as, as according, you know, along the, the rainforest. So the, the evapotranspiration and their effect on cloud formation through the production of aerosols and cloud condensation nuclei have an overall cooling and moistening effect on regional scales above the, the rainforest. They're home to many indigenous peoples and local communities, long history of human habitation and high biocultural diversity in these rainforests. So this shows you one of the, the, the moist uh, wet rainforests here, like in you know, the main, over here, the green areas and the brown areas are more of a drier type of uh, 
forest. They're tropical dry forests, they call them, you know, looking something like this. So this is in East Brazil, this is in West Brazil. This is, this is in, this region here is here, this guy, and the drier ones are, are this, okay? So that's what we have. And there's evidence for, uh, you know, the their uh, tropical rainforests are experiencing deforestation, degradation due to land use change across the tropics. Okay, um, there's been recent extreme droughts driven by climate variability modes, such as the ENSO El Nino Southern Oscillation in 2014 to 16, the Atlantic Dipole in 2005 and 2010. Many, many more droughts occurring. Um, there's excessive, extensive tree mortality even up to three years after a peak drought. Okay, so, so these, these forests are, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're deeply stressed. Um, there's probably some threshold between a thousand and two thousand millimeters, you know, less than that, and they become, uh, you know, we lose a lot more. They become more fire prone, more disease prone, more stress. So global warming, of course, is, you know, is changing the intricate pattern between the forest and the rainfall. Um, the deforestation and degradation doing the same thing. Um, regional climate change, we're getting, you know, as we lose more and more trees, we get more and more open canopy, and then there can be fires, you know, it's not as wet, and more and more fires, more and more loss. So we're getting all of these stresses on the uh, tropical rainforests. And I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to go into all of the details. You can have a look at it. This is, again, this is all open source. Okay, so huge stress on the tropical rainforest. The boreal forests and the tundra are in this region. The boreal forests are this color green and the tundra at the very northern extent of it. The boreal forests are also called taiga. They span about 1.135 million hectares or one point, that's 1,135 million hectares or 1.135 billion. Compare that to 1.95 billion of the, um, of the tropical rainforests. Um, they're all located in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, um, they store 272 gigatons of carbon, right? Compare that to the 471, I believe it was, for the tropical rainforest. So, you know, it's uh, just over half. Uh, most of it is stored between below ground, the carbon. And management varies, but there's illegal logging. That's a critical driver of boreal forest loss. Boreal forest growth is constrained by a short vegetation period, right? Short growing season. Dynamics involve long scale disturbances like insect outbreaks and fire. Okay, so fires became become a big deal, as you know, in boreal forests in Canada um, in, in 2023. There's different disturbance regimes between the Eurasian and the American forests or North American forests. Okay, so here, this is showing a typical boreal forest. You've got the trees, you've got lots of swamps. This is Southern Norway. Okay, and there is tipping, there is evidence for tipping dynamics, although it needs to be looked at in, in, in more detail. And, uh, you know, we've seen a huge increase in the fires uh, just in the last year, and it talks about that. It talks about um, sensitivity of trees to change, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, uh, you know, some things um, that I do, uh, you know, I'll show you this. This this shows you a conceptual regional transect from a moist to dry localities um, in the uh, forest. Okay, so you get you've got different atmospheric moisture flows. You get in this regime here. You have uh, the evergreen trees, the conifers, and then as you get uh, you know less and less, uh, as you get uh, changes in the climate, you get the deciduous trees, and then you get uh, very very few trees in the dry situation. And this shows the soil layers, the different soil layers, water in the soil layers. Um, and uh, as you get fewer and fewer trees, the surface gets smoother, the roughness declines, you get higher and higher wind speeds as well. 
Okay, now this shows how complicated the chain of uh, change is within the feedback system. So if you have less forest, what this means is there's less evapotranspiration, there's less productivity, less carbon stored, there's less interception of the rain, uh, the roots aren't as deep, so there's reduced atmospheric moisture supply, right? The roots uh, bring up lots of water from the deep soils to the atmosphere. So there's less local and downwind precipitation, and that leads to there's less tree produced VOCs, volatile organic compounds. They serve as cloud condensation nuclei, and therefore there's reduced local and downward precipitation because there's less of these VOCs. So there's decreased roughness of the landscape. So there's higher wind speeds that, that reduces the residence time of moisture in the overall forest system, right? The wind dries it out. So there's less cloud formation, less evapotranspiration, less VOCs, higher wind speeds. So there's less reflectivity of sunlight, that does higher temperatures, higher atmospheric water demand, like drought stress, which leads to Increased temperatures due to less evaporative cooling, decreased shading in the canopy and ground proximity, so higher atmospheric water demand, drought stress. So there's an open can a more open canopy, drier understory, less decomposition. So larger pools of dead material to burn, increasing the risk of fires, which leads to higher wind speeds, less soil moisture, less soil retention capacity leading to higher erosion. So there's a surplus of atmospheric CO2 by losing biomass carbon, losing a potential future carbon sink. A forest is still capable of increasing biomass due to CO2 fertilization. So there's global climate change worsens, so there's less forest, and you get this whole vicious feedback loop. And uh, more and more loss of boreal forests. Okay, now between the... Uh, tropical forests and the boreal forests, we have the temperate forests. Okay, they cover 767 million hectares, about 34% of global carbon sinks are there. It stores about 119 gigatons, so that's less than the two pre previous forests discussed. Now, humans live in this region, right? So they're highly fragmented. They follow, it follow, this follows a long history of human land use and forestry practices. In fact, there's only very, there, there are only a few temperate forests which are considered intact primary forest. The vast majority are managed by humans using vastly varying forest management techniques and intensities. They're often monocultures or mixtures of very few tree species with low biodiversity and low structural diversity. In other words, they're all the same age, they're clear-cut and then planted, clear-cut and planted, optimized for high timber yields and certain wood features established under the assumption of stable climate and environmental conditions. So they're not very resilient, basically. So here's one that looks great in, uh, in Germany, and here's one, this is spruce, uh, which has been devastated. Large synchronous landscape scale forest dieback spruce it's a spruce monoculture maybe it was a disease took out all the whole forest because it's all the same species all about the same age so there are evidence for tipping dynamics um, in these forests as well now let's look at savannas and and grasslands okay we don't normally think of these things tipping but they can go back into forested regions or they can go to uh, completely dry regions desert regions so there's arid to semi-arid grassy biomes around the world in the brown and there's wetter ones in the green and there's examples of both all around the world uh you know in these images here so anytime you see the greener ones there's more water available obviously the other ones are less water available okay but these things can tip either way um they're and uh you know it's happened in the past um so you can see you know if you've got a tree canopy you've got uh, co2 fertilization increased rainfall nutrient deposition can make the trees grow 
if the trees are growing, then you get fewer grass productivity and accumulation because you get them shaded out. The fertilization causes the grass to grow. Alien grass invasions affect more and more grass. Gra grazing reduces it. If you have very few trees, you can get very, very rapid burning of the grass, frequent fires, that keeps the trees out, right? So if you have frequent fires, you're less likely to have a tree canopy and so on. So there's all of these different key feedbacks with the savanna tipping. Um, I'm not going to go into all of those details. Uh, the drylands. Drylands are hyper-arid, arid, semi-arid, and dry subhumid climate zones. Rainfall is less than 65% of the potential evapor evapotranspiration. The amount of evaporation that would occur if enough water were available. 46% of the Earth's surface, 38% of the world's human population. Many people live in these dry lands. Vegetation types include desert, uh, deserts, grasslands, shrublands, woodlands, savannas, Mediterranean forests, and tropical dry forests. So, so this is a good map. I know it's hard to read this, but this is these are very, very, uh, you know, these are cold, arid regions, right? The, the poles, the, 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 the north region, very, you know, basically desert because it gets very little uh, rainfall, very little precipitation, rather. And then you've got the very arid regions and semi-arid and less arid and then to the humid region. So this shows you the global distribution of the dry land subtypes based on this so-called aridity index. Okay, and, uh, you know, basically the dry areas can get drier and the wet areas can get wetter and there's tipping dynamics that can be seen. There's an aridity index and that, you know, shows you how that's changing and there's different thresholds associated with it. And I'm not going to go into those details. You know, there's a lot of different loops. Uh, here you get rainfall and if there's water availability, vegetation growth and so on. You know that the the impacts with the soil microbes, the vegetation covers, different soils, etc. So there's lots of different interactions in that system, right? Think of everything as a system. Okay, um, I have to move on. I'm just uh, trying to touch on a lot of these topics, but the next topic is the freshwater ecosystems, right? Freshwater bodies like lakes are common across most biomes. They form unique and sometimes isolated ecosystems, right? There's different, uh, you know, they're vital for, for the regions that they're in. Uh, this is showing you lakes across the planet, most of them up here in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and uh, of course, rivers would be a separate idea. Here, here's a lake that is showing eutrophic urban lake. It gets high nutrient uh, or high organic matter, so it loading leading to elevated methane emissions. Uh, you know, they turn greenish, these lakes. Here's a lake, uh, here, here is a boreal brown water lake with the high, you know, deep water anoxia, high emissions of CO2, lots of dissolved organic content, then all the way to a thermokarst lake in the tundra. And these are uh, more, uh, uh, you know, this is a permafrost saw uh, uh, lake, a permafrost slump and filled with water and then thermokarst lakes in the Yukon. So there's all different types of lakes um, and we're getting, with warming, we're getting um, local but widespread eutrophication of various lakes and we're also getting boreal browning and loss of permafrost ponds in the north. So, so there's a changing situation here. This shows the interactive role of eutrophication. So greenhouse gas emissions, you get increasing temperature, causes more stratification of the water in the lake, right? Warm water on top, colder below. Um, you also get uh, more organic carbon going into the lake, so increased uh, uh, increased uh, heterotrophy, what's known as heterotrophy of the of the food chain or the the trophic levels in the in the lake, and the, with the nutrient loading, you get an increased algae that uh, blocks sunlight. The algae decomposes, uh, sinks to the bottom, decomposes, and causes oxygen depletion benthic, which is the bottom oxygen depletion, and uh, you also get a phosphorus release from the sediments in the lake. 
and that feeds in more nutrients. So you can have internal nutrient loading, you know, once you trigger this, this whole cycle. Okay, so you can assess the lakes with different, in different ways. Um, if, now we'll move to coastal ecosystems. So basically warm water coral reefs. So here's warm water coral reefs in different regions of the planet. They span the Earth's tropical and subtropical ocean. Some are, est they, it, it's estimated that warm water coral reefs support over half a billion people for the livelihoods and over a quarter of marine species for part of their life cycle. They can cross the threshold of ecosystem collapse when they cease to have sufficient cover, about 10%, and diversity of hard corals to support the wide diversity of species, uh, taxa, and ecological interactions typical of a coral reef. So it's an ecological phenomena at local scale, but it's very important on a global scale. And these leaves, the, these these coral reefs are being stressed around the world and we're losing them rapidly. So the thermal stress is driven by increasingly warmer oceans and superimposed El Nino extreme events, right? That leads to marine heat waves. It's the primary driver of regional scale mortality of hard corals. Coral bleaching occurs when the thermal stress causes corals to expel this symbiotic algae that provides them with food, right? So they lose their color because it's the algae that have the color and that can result in death if it occurs frequently enough to prevent recovery. So if the water stays warm for too long, the algae just don't bother coming back and the coral reef dies and it, 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 you get algae covering the coral reef instead and the reef is basically a dead ecosystem. Okay, so coral mortality may play out over weeks to a few months, for example, for the thermal stress-induced bleaching or years for chronic you know, there's chronic threats like diseases and land-based impacts can threaten it. But prolonged failure to recover and the coral reefs basically collapsed and dead. And there's a lot of other stresses like ocean acidification, overfishing, pollution, invertebrate predators, sea level rise, right? Um, generally lowers the thermal threshold for bleaching and our mortality, brings forward the timing of the collapse or even surpasses the thermal stress in local importance. And these are a bunch of coral reefs around the world. There's some uh, that haven't been affected, but basically the scale goes from bleaching, uh, white circles are no bleaching, colored circles from 1% bleaching is blue, 100% bleaching is yellow. Okay, so the yellow, 100% bleaching. And you know, this year, last year and this year have just been horrendous. So this year is even worse. We're having a mass mortality event because of the huge, uh, you know, very extremely high wa uh, water temperatures. So we're losing the coral reefs. You're watching the coral reefs on Earth disappear, die off. And uh, they talk about the tipping dynamics and the first, uh, you know, the first reported global bleaching event was in 1998 with that strong El Nino warming of 0 0.6 Celsius, 350 parts per million, corresponding to strong El Nino on top, um, right? They assessed uh, 1.2 Celsius as a temperature when, and we're there, we're well past there. So, you know, we're basically, the thermal bleaching tipping points have already been passed in the majority of coral reef regions, right? The risk of ecosystem collapse is already predicted at high levels in all coral reef regions assessed. We're basically losing coral reefs around the world. It's happening right now as we watch. And this shows you some of the different climate change hazards, warming, extreme events, sea level rise in different places, the, the people it's affecting, women, vulnerable groups, indigenous people, small scale fishers, small island developing states, the economic vulnerability, you know, uh, tourism, fisheries, transport, and so on. Okay, so, you know, here's another, uh, this is showing mangrove species. So, you know, mangroves are being threatened on coasts around the world, and they're very important homes for many fish species, etc. You know, here's some mangroves here. Um, this is uh, seagrasses. Um, seagrasses are, you know, growing around the world, and they capture huge amounts of carbon. You know, here's uh, what they can look at here. 
and this can be uh you know this was this was i believe you know three three years later or something right so we're just losing the seagrasses here's uh some of the the, the loss and damage of, of uh of, this is this is damages from tropical cyclones of course when tropical cyclones hit they can wipe out uh, coastal structures. So this was mangrove forests that were wiped out by a tropical cyclone, basically. Okay, so that's another stressor. Um, mangrove die-off, uh, more, more images, right? And this is regional differences in climate drivers leading to mangrove impacts. So various regions are being hit hard. You know, there's cyclones, precipitation changes, sea level rise, temperature increases, climate oscillations, stressing the mangroves, and uh, this is seagrass meadows where there's, you know, risks of huge rapid decline. And they're all carbon sinks. So these, we're losing the carbon sinks. Um, this is showing regime shifts and tipping points in the global marine environment. So kelp barren, kelp, loss of kelp in the blue, uh, oxygen, uh, hypoxia so this is this is the same sort of uh, blooms like i talked about this for freshwater lakes but it's also occurring in the ocean in more and more spots uh, especially in the gulf of mexico from all this uh, nutrient runoff in mississippi but over many parts of the world you know there, there's no oxygen at the bottom so the life just dies fisheries collapses these are coastal fisheries collapses community shifts, um, biological community shifts, and the loss of the biological pump in those regions. Okay, so fisheries collapses, right? Over past decades, many fisheries have collapsed, primarily due to over-exploitation. Think of the Newfoundland cod, if you're Canadian. Um, and now this is happening more and more often. Um, among more than 200 exploited fish stocks, 23% of the species showed at least one stock collapse. 40% uh, of the collapsed stocks present different regimes of productivity, and they don't. Uh, there's, they're like they they talk about um, regime shifts in the Atlantic cod stock. It's a perfect example. I picked up a book in when I was in Newfoundland on the cod fishery collapse and. I have to read it in the next little while. Maybe I'll do a separate video on it because it's a good example of, you know, how permanent these things can be. I mean, the cod industry never opened up. It never recovered. And there's reasons, there's explanations and reasons why here, you know, the, 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 we're, we're all connected, right? There's a whole system of life um, and uh, we're all connected and the whole marine food chain is changing as we change certain parts of it and coral reefs will have a huge impact the loss of global coral reefs will have a, an enormous impact on the entire uh, global food chain you know here's here's a kelp forest i was fortunate enough to scuba dive uh, many years ago off catalina island um, in southern california and i scuba dived on one of these kelp um, you know it's like it's kelp regions i mean the water's about 100 feet deep Kelp went from root anchored on the floor, went right to the surface. Leaves are huge because there's little buoyancy bulbs. You don't need the plant to expand energy to support it, have a structure to support it like a tree. And, you know, the light coming through, this is, I could have taken this picture. <laughs> it's an amazing experience that I had years ago. And I think those coral reefs, those coral, I think those kelp beds off California are pretty much gone at this stage. Um, they talk about the uh there's a seasonal lipid fat pump it's uh mostly high latitude oceans there's a seasonal vertical migration of lipid rich zooplankton into the deep ocean where they overwinter for over six months they directly inject carbon below the water mixed layer i didn't know about that okay so that's changing uh, marine oxygenation uh, coastal hypoxia, these are hypoxic areas, another separate map on hypoxia, right? The oxygen level in the water is below a certain amount, it's usually at the bottom in these regions, and you can't have fish live, it's pretty much dead zones. They talk about some of the fisheries uh, for small, fast-growing fish, large, slow-growing fish, fisheries cod, um, and uh, 
community shifts, shifts in the kelp forest, shifts in ocean hypoxia. Okay, so we're stressing the oceans in, in a big way. Um, so basically, uh, this, uh, you know, if you have to do, uh, you know, research on how, uh, you know, any of, any of these biomes are changing, uh, this uh, global tipping uh, Global Tipping Points document has loads of stuff, loads of references, loads of papers, and it explains things nice and clearly. So next, my next video will be talking about tipping points in the ocean and atmosphere circulation. So thanks for listening. Please consider going to my website, paulbeckwith.net, and donating at my PayPal to support my research and videos. Thanks again, and bye for now.